grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Happy Palm Sunday. It is a good day to gather together and sing Hosanna to the King of Kings, the one who is worthy of all worship. As we gather in this place, a couple of announcements. You've been told there's going to be a ministry meeting today for children's ministry, those with children, those interested in children, those who like to work with children. Well, that's going to be moved to the first Sunday of May, right, Melissa? Okay, cool. Yes. First Sunday of May, so that is postponed a little bit. Also, don't forget, next Sunday, what is kind of a holiday, right? Yes, it's Easter, Resurrection Sunday. We have our 7.30 sunrise service out by the crosses, and you can park right from the sign towards the school so you don't have very far to walk. We'll have chairs out there, 7.30 sunrise service, breakfast in between, choir cantata during breakfast, the children and youth will have an Easter egg hunt, and then 11 o'clock, our regular scheduled worship service. So, I hope to see you all then. Well, I think that's all the housekeeping. Let's go to God in prayer. Melissa, tackle them if you got to. Okay. Let's pray. God, we come before you now singing Hosanna to you, for you are worthy of praise. The same Lord who rode into Jerusalem humbly on a donkey is the same Lord who we proclaim today and whose name we come to praise. As we gather in this place, may your Holy Spirit move among us and through us. May it be felt. And may we go forth proclaiming what our Lord has done for us. Give us open eyes, open ears, and open hearts to be sent out by you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start singing Hosanna, loud Hosanna. There's special things coming.
After he said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called Mount of, Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who are sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked him, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they let Jesus they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He said, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shed out would shout out. I'm talking. Yeah, there you go. Whoa, you got to really talk into it. Good morning. I love a parade. You all did great in the parade this morning. 
because when Jesus came into Jerusalem, all of the people were there, and they were so excited because it was a parade in town. Have you ever been to a parade? Yeah, well, Layla's going to help me here. Would you come up and pull something out of the sack, and let's see, one at a time, let's, let's see what kind of, wait a minute, let me try. Pull something out. Wait, this one, wait, this one. Up, 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 up. What's this? What's this? What parade do we have with this? What, what, what do we celebrate when we have this? Halloween, yes. Have you ever been in a Halloween parade? In your costumes, you've never walked one behind the other and had a little parade so everybody can see how you're dressed? I bet you had, but you hadn't even thought that that was a parade. Okay, wait, let me see if you need. Let me pull something out. What's that for? A hat. And look at it. American hat. Yes, it is. And you know what holiday we celebrate when we have that parade? The 4th of July. Oh, awesome. Okay, you pull something else out. What's that? An egg. Okay. And we're getting ready to celebrate that holiday, aren't we? Easter. Oh my goodness. What, what, Santa, what parade do we have when we have Santa? A Christmas parade? Yes. Okay, okay. And there's one big one here. Yeah, can you pull this one out? <gasps> What's this one? No. Happy what does it say? Birthday. Happy birthday. Yes. This is what my friend Debbie made when my husband had his 90th birthday because we were in lockdown and we couldn't have a party. So we had a parade to celebrate his birthday, and she made that card for him. Okay, you sit down. Sit down. Layla's going to pull the last one out for us. I think it's way down in the bottom. That is a hand, isn't it? It's this part of my hand. What do we call that part of our hand? It's the palm of our hand. And this is Palm Sunday. Let's put our palms together as we pray. Dear God, thank you for the celebrations we have in life. We are so grateful to have Palm Sunday to celebrate your son. Amen.
So as we gather in this place, we gather with all of the stuff of life. We bring with us that which makes us rejoice and that which brings us down, that which stresses us out, that which gets between us and our Lord. But Jesus coming to Jerusalem on a donkey reminds us that we do not serve a God who shies away from humanity in all of their mess, but one who draws near and comes close. So we're going to take all of that to God just as we are right now. We're going to pray silently, and then I will pray for us aloud. Let's go to God in prayer. O oh God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, we have gathered this morning in your house to worship your name. To give thanks for the gift of your Son, our Lord, who came to us. Lord, your word tells us that he came not as a conquering hero, not in a display of might or force, but humbly, so that he might beckon us to him. Oh God, we confess that we live in a world at which powers exercise control over us, over nations, over justice. And God, we see the brokenness that results from that. But God, in the midst of that, we see a different way in our Lord Jesus Christ. The one of ultimate power and authority who came not to lord over us, but to lay down his life for us. Oh God, may we, your people, live that example in our broken world, where nations rage, where hope is deferred, where people and relationships and homes and communities are broken, O oh Lord. Oh God, we gather here knowing so many in need of your healing touch. God, we know today those who mourn the loss of a loved one. We know those whose loved one is on hospice, those who face a unfortunate, an unfortunate physical future. And God, we lift them up to you. Praying, God, for healing of heart and healing of body. But knowing that, God, what we really pray always is that you would make people okay. And, God, we trust in you. We know that in you, you have endless options to make right that which we can't conceive of. So God, bring healing of heart and mind and body in all the ways in which you work it. Oh God, we come before you now confessing that while we are called to go forth with glad shouts of Hosanna, so often, God, we are timid. So often, God, we make mistakes. So often, we go with a different crowd. Lord, for those things, for the ways in which we contribute to the brokenness in our world. Forgive us, O Lord, and make us different, better, and new. God, we praise you that every time we come before you, we get a fresh start, time and time again. And that because of what our Lord Jesus Christ did on that cross, in a mystery too beautiful and terrible, and grand for us to understand. We thank you that we get a new start. That you look at us not for what we deserve, but for whose we are, because God, we are his. God, may we go forth and live like it. In Jesus' name, amen. I love this Palm Sunday scripture, because I think the Palm Sunday story, the triumphal entry as it's called, Well, it kind of gives us a glimpse into the kingdom of God. A glimpse into really kind of what the church should look like. We have the grizzled veterans of Jesus' earthly ministry. Those who had been with him from the beginning had seen every miracle. Those who had preached, right? 
We also have people who have no idea why they're there. They just heard that this Jesus is in town. Maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he healed some people. We think there's this guy named Lazarus out in Bethany. We heard he was dead and now he ain't. So they go to see, taking their very man from the end of town. You have Galilean fishermen from the middle of nowhere. You have Jerusalem city dwellers. You have Pharisees who still don't know what to make of him. All in a mismatch. But all proclaiming that here he is. Here is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We also know they have mixed up motivations and understandings for why they're there. Some, like Mary from last week's story, I guarantee you she was in the crowd and she knew what Jesus was here for. She knew he was the Lamb of God who would lay down his life. But there are plenty in the crowd who thought that Jesus was coming to overthrow the Romans, kick out the oppressor, and return Israel to its former glory. You have so many differences in that crowd, yet in that moment, they're unified by one purpose and one purpose only. Being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaiming His praise. When you think about it, that's a pretty good admonition for what the kingdom of heaven is to be and what the church is to do. To seek regardless of level of experience, regardless of life history, seek out Christ and proclaim His glory and name. And that's what they're doing. And it's beautiful because when we look about it, what could be more exciting than Jesus Christ, God in flesh coming to you, the promised one? I mean, there's nothing more exciting, is there? There's nothing on earth that makes us more excited than what Jesus has done for us, right? Maybe not. Because you see, I have a confession to make. In my house, we have a problem with some idolatry. Yes, my adorable, beloved son Asher has an idol. Something he praises, like Spider-Man or Batman, oh no. It's not a famous athlete, it's darn sure not me or his mother. It's not even his favorite human, his pop-pop. It's the trash truck. I kid you not, he praises the trash truck. This started when we were in Wichita Falls And Beth was locked down with this kid during COVID and she just watched endless episodes of any kid's show that would kind of keep him quiet and entertained, right? Desperate times, desperate measures. And one of these shows that became his favorite and still is, is called Trash Truck. The main character is a talking trash truck and a little boy named Hank. And he just took to it. But see, there in Wichita Falls, we had a back alley where they picked up the dumpsters. So he never really encountered a trash truck in real life. But he had trash truck toys, trash truck movie, a trash truck night-night book, all of the above. Yeah, we're keeping that franchise in business in my house. But when we got to Kerrville, now we have the miracle for him of curbside pickup. Trash truck is with us. And it's so funny because this kid cannot tell one day from the other, but pretty soon, once he figured out that Trash Truck makes a triumphal entry into our neighborhood every Thursday morning at the crack of dawn, now on Wednesday night he starts watching for my preparation for this entry, right? Because I'm going around pulling the trash, I go put it in the bin, I take it out, and he starts chanting, Trash Truck, Trash Truck. We can hardly get him to bed that night, but we until sunrise then on Thursday morning we have to get up early take him out into the yard so that he can greet the trash truck (laughs) and when trash truck comes by it is no grin and wave it is jumping up and down shouting screaming pumping his fists in the air and initially the guy who drives the trash truck like this 21 year old guy with long dreadlocks would look at my kid like what? in the world. Apparently our sanitation engineers don't have a um, welcoming committee in most neighborhoods, but they they do in mine. But now this young man will wave and honk and raise the arm up and down a couple times. It's awesome. (laughs) No, my son Asher has a religious experience 
with trash truck. And right, and it's, it's funny, and it's adorable, and, and we're not worried because, right, he's two. He'll grow out of it. I hope. <laughs> if not, hey, that's a, that's a city job. He'll get his CDL. I'll save money on tuition. We're great. <laughs> but we don't worry, right? Surely this is not going to be something he gets that pumped about for life. And surely we as adults would never heap our adoration, all of our anticipation, put so much of ourselves into caring about something that's not Jesus, would we? Would we? No, while what Asher does is ridiculous, I think back and I've, I've seen us do it too, right? I remember in 2008 I was at the Nokia Theater to see Coldplay in concert. And as we're sitting there, it's thousands of people, and it's this raucous, loud crowd. But then the lights start to dim, and you know the show's about to start. And it was amazing the power that these celebrities have, because before they stepped out on stage, thousands of people went silent. You could hear a pin drop. Over the rustling of stadium junk food, over the clanking of highway robbery priced beers, suddenly, dead silence. And then the band comes out and they all jump to their feet and they're yelling and cheering and jumping like Asher when he sees a trash truck or like us with the palms. And I remember to this day like it happened 10 minutes ago, I look at Joni, my friend on my left, and Jared on my right and I go, that's worship. That that I am seeing is without a doubt worship. To get that excited, to shout, to focus that intently on something. That's worship in its own way. And friends, we do it. We pay a whole lot of attention to things. We heap adoration and get our affirmation from things that are other than Jesus. I've seen that same kind of reaction when the latest iPhone drops when I was a youth minister. I've seen it when the latest season of Yellowstone comes out. Though it's awesome. No, all the time we pay attention to things. We get super excited about things that ultimately don't do a whole lot for us. And I think the scripture stands out in that what if we took a little bit more of that excitement and use it in light of what Jesus Christ, the one on a donkey, has done for you and for me. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you have to jump up and down like my son every time we come into this building. I'm not saying you need to throw cloaks down in front of the altar. But what if we took some of that excitement that we have for so many relatively meaningless things and expressed it a little more about our Lord and what He has done? Because this scripture teaches us something, and I think that key point is that humans are made to worship. Friends, you are going to worship something. It's innate in our nature, right? We love to unite with others to focus on and proclaim joyously that which is bigger than us. And that's certainly not all bad. That is why we come together as the body of Christ in worship. Also, that desire to focus on that which moves us together and brings us together is probably why humans came up with art, music, the cross-cultural love of beauty and nature, it's good. But how often do we allow that seeking to place so much of our value and our work and our resources on something that is not the one who made us? Because you see, we have choices every day as in terms of what we will worship, in terms of what we will proclaim, in terms of where our attention goes. And in this scripture, it's not just a modern problem. That was also going on right then, if you kind of look between the lines of the story. Most historians agree that there were two parades in town that week. Maybe even that very day. It's the week of Passover, when all the observant Jews would come to Jerusalem to worship. And historically, that was the time of year that as they come and they praise God and remember God's promises they start to get a little bold with their Roman overlords. 
That's when like seven different times in the first century, a rebellion will start in Jerusalem, usually around Passover. So what happens is every year around this time, Pontius Pilate, the military governor, will leave his seaside home in Caesarea and ride in in a military parade and take up residence for the week. Pontius Pilate is in Jerusalem to judge Jesus, not because that's his home, but because he is here as part of a military show of force once a year. Pontius Pilate would have come in from the west side, Jesus from the east, Pilate on a brilliant white stallion, exquisitely trained to be his personal mount. He would have been clad in armor and a crested helmet, carrying a gladius surrounded by a cavalry detachment. It would have been an awe-inspiring sight to anybody there and sent a clear message who is in charge. Jesus' parade, on the other hand, that happened at least within the day or so, but probably actually simultaneously, stands in stark contrast. Coming in on an unbroken donkey's baby. Pilate comes in and I don't know, it would be an up-armored Humvee or the State Department black suburban cavalcade. Jesus comes in in a Honda Civic. <laughs> Little different way of being. Pontius Pilate is a man, just a man, given authority, but to keep that authority there's no one he wouldn't kill even though his salary comes from what they pay him. Jesus, on the other hand, comes in needing nothing from them. God in flesh, the one who through whom all things are made, yet he comes in on a mission to lay down his life to prove that his love is real. What you see here in the Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, is there's two separate parades, and those people there had a choice of which one they're going to go to. Where are you going to pay attention to this worldly display of military might or to the humble one who offers himself for us? And I got to tell you, Pilate's parade was larger. Because people are there either to curry favor with the overlords or they're there to just stare in disgust or maybe plot how would we go about taking these guys. Or they're there just to see the spectacle and the example to follow that crowd. Jesus, on the other hand, coming in the smaller gate, in humility with a ragtag group of followers, is the exact opposite and presents us with a choice. Do you pay attention and heap your adoration and your sense of self from worldly powers who only exist because we propagate them, or do you spend your adoration, your worship, that thing that gives you your identity, do you get it from the one who needs nothing from you and gave you everything? There's a third crowd here, though. And that happens a couple days later, after Jesus is arrested by Pilate. After Pilate even says, I don't find a reason to kill this man. After Pilate beats him and wants to let him go, there's another crowd. The crowd who shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, shouts something else by the end of the week. What is it? Crucify him. Because Pilate comes out and says, I can turn him loose. I can either let him loose and go free, or Barabbas, who do you want? And this time, this crowd that had welcomed him cry out, crucify him. If you let him go, you are no friend of your Caesar. What we see here in this story of two parades and three separate crowds is one, you're going to worship. We are made to look to something bigger than ourselves. Is it going to be the powers of this world that take and take and take? Or is it going to be the one who gave it all? The second thing that we sometimes don't like to admit is that the fickle crowd shows us is that we are more influenced by outside things than we'd like to admit. We all like to think that we march to the beat of our own drummer, that we are independent and strong. But there are plenty there in Jesus' entry who simply went because they heard a racket, the crowd was going, and following that crowd got them close to Jesus. And maybe they learned something. There's also a crowd who saw Pilate's might, simply went along with the crowd, and then when someone in the crowd, possibly even a plant, 
starts shouting, crucify him, how the crowd turns. We want to be strong and independent, but when we get down to it, the influences of those around us, our culture, our crowd, can change you and can change me. And that's a caution of this story. As I have tried to follow Christ, there are friendships that I had to remove from my crowd that didn't serve Him anymore. I love a wide variety of music and a wide variety of film, but that stuff too crowds our eyes, crowds our ears, changes the way I look at the world. Sometimes we have to think, what am I setting in front of me? We carry crowds in our pockets now and our smartphones. For my generation, everything on Facebook, Instagram, all sorts of things, TikTok, we carry a crowd with us that influences us in a million different ways. And in it, I tend to, you know what, find my own little echo chamber. People who think like me, people who vote like me, people whose opinions and lifestyle are exactly the same as mine, and in that way, that crowd makes me overlook the needs of others and the belovedness of others. In a million ways, in a million places, we too go along with the crowd. So what do we do about this warning? What do we do about this scripture? Well, friends, I think the way to worship that which is worthy of worship is to remember what is actually happening in front of us. Very few in that triumphal entry knew what was going on, but guys, on the other side of the cross and the tomb, we know exactly what's happening. We need to remember that every time we gather at this table, we are encountering that one who gave it all for us. Every time we join hands around a table praying as a family, it is that name, the one about whom they shouted, Hosanna, whose name we are lifting up. Every time we read the scripture, it's his word, his message, his life story we're encountering. And when we get it, when we understand what we are seeing, how can we worship anything else? And maybe, just maybe, we would pursue our faith with a little bit of that enthusiasm like Asher for Trash Truck. Secondly, friends, let's be cautious about the crowds we run with. You're going to run with a crowd. Lean on those in your life who are going to the same place, who are pursuing the Lord, who hold you lovingly accountable. That's called the church. Make sure you're putting things in front of your eyes that lift up His name and praise Him and build you up. Because our world is crowded, crowded, crowded with stuff that will put you further from Him. And friends, you're going to worship something. Let's make sure it's the name that is above all other names. Amen. Here at this table, we encounter the Lord who came to us humbly, who needed nothing from us, but gave it all for us. 
That is who we proclaim and praise and worship here when we remember how on the night when he was to be betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat of it in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink of it in remembrance of me. Sisters and brothers, as often as we come to this table, we encounter our Lord. We proclaim His life, His death, and His resurrection until He comes again. Let us pray. Almighty Father, as we gather at this table, we see You coming to save us from ourselves through Your everlasting grace in the form of Christ riding on a colt. On this day when we remember his triumphal entry into Jerusalem to begin his journey to the cross, we are mindful that he walked this path for us. And so at this table, we ask that your Holy Spirit might transform these elements, the bread representing Christ's body broken for us, and the cup representing his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins into spiritual spiritual sustenance, emboldening us to follow in his footsteps that took him to Calvary, and encouraging us to pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
We now come to the time in our worship service when we return a measure of our gifts to God's service. As we do so, let us be mindful that God indeed loves a cheerful giver. And so let us give from a full heart, secure in the knowledge that Christ came to save us from sin and reconcile us to God so that we might serve him each according to our best attributes. Let us now praise, give praise and thanks to God with our offering. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior, and for the many other blessings we have received. As we cheerfully return a measure of our financial gifts toward your service, we ask for your guidance in using them in ways that are the best used toward your service. We pray that they may give honor to your name and enable our service to you through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We are sent forth to proclaim the name of our Lord and Savior. But before we do that, we always offer an invitation that we model here at this table. If there's anyone here who would like to join with us in what we're doing at First Christian Church, or if you would like to make a confession of faith, you may come forward during our hymn of invitation. Before you go, church, receive this benediction. Go forth rejoicing because our humble Lord has given you salvation. Go proclaiming His name and worshiping Him who is worthy of worship. Go in peace. Amen.